Children are amazing. Children are unique and magical. They can dream anything. They can become anything. They can heal, they can survive, they can grow, they can come back. They can be agents of change. If we give them the opportunities, if we, the adults, take our responsibility and protect children, listen to children and support children. In the world today, there are 2.2 billion children. Each and every one of them has the same rights and the same values. The same rights to life, to survival, to health, to development, to play, to make their voice heard. Yet today, this is not the case. We have in the world, however, agreed to rights that are equal to every child. The global community have agreed to children's rights, and these are not just any rights. These are the rights that a child needs to develop to its full potential. To me, this is the most beautiful transformation, metamorphosis of them all, for a child to become what he or she was meant to be. This is my passion, and this is what I have been dedicated many years of my professional life to. And today I would like to share with you an outlook of what is the state of the world's children today, and what do we need to do to make sure that every child gets the right to develop to its full potential. In 1959, was the first declaration of children's rights in the General Assembly of United Nations. In 1989, the Convention of the Rights of the Child was adopted and it entered into force in 1990. 196 countries have signed the Convention, have promised to fulfill these rights to every child. And we have done a lot of progress since the 50s. Child mortality has gone down. Education levels have gone up, including for girls. We have eradicated diseases that, would, that killed a lot of children many years ago. We have young people taking the floor within the United Nations Conference of the Parties on Climate Change. A lot of things has been happening. We can realize children's rights. However, in the last three years, we have seen major setbacks for children's rights. Not since the Second World War had we had more children dependent on acute humanitarian help. That is a basic needs like clean water, nutrition and shelter. More children than since the Second World War. We have 400 billion children today living in conflicts and war. As we are sitting here tonight, the fighting is going on in Sudan. We have about 55,000 children in Sudan today, depending on medical care to survive the severe malnutrition they was already suffering for before the conflict broke out. In Syria, had my daughter Johanna lived in Syria, she's 11 years old, she would not have lived a single day without being in a country that is in war or in conflict. Very close to us, we have the Ukraine. Ukraine has 7.5 million children. Half of the children of Ukraine has had to leave their country. Children, which is the future of the country, who are supposed to build the country, has had to leave. And there are many, many, many more of these conflicts going on right now. And if we think about the pandemic, during these three years of the COVID pandemic, 
We had never seen such big setbacks when it comes to education levels and in children's health. If you were to represent all the 10 years old of the world, 70% of you cannot read a simple text. You are in your home country, in your mother tongue, and you cannot read the simplest text on the bus or on the television. This figure before the pandemic was 53%. In the beginning of this week, UNICEF presented its State of the World report. The focus of this year's report was child vaccinations. In the last three years, we lost 30 years of progress when it comes to eradicate diseases like measles, polio, diphtery and other diseases that in Sweden, since many, many years, we have managed to avoid. In three years, 30 years was lost in child routine immunization. And why is this? It is because very often when a decision is taken, there is no analysis no consequences paid to the effect of children. Like the school closures. Sweden was an exception here, but 92% of the world's children were faced with school closures. And therefore, the results I told you. And the healthcare service was overstressed by dealing with the COVID pandemic. So routine vaccinations was put on a hold. Mothers and fathers didn't, couldn't leave their houses to even go to the healthcare centers out in the countryside. Another challenge that you and all young people in the world are facing is the one of climate change. More than a billion of the two billion children in the world live in countries, the 30 countries where there is already extreme consequences of climate change drafts, flooding. I was in Pakistan in November last year, just three months after the flooding started, affected millions of people in Pakistan, erasing their livelihoods, their houses, their, the few cattle they had, everything was gone, schools, hospitals, because of the climate change already affecting this country so hard. In this country, in a temporary shelter uh, north of Dadu in the region of Sindh, I met a girl called Hinda. She is nine years old. She came to this temporary shelter with her grandmother suffering from cholera. There is no clean water to be found. So as a mother or grandmother, you are cooking or using the little water you can find. And Hinda came to this temporary shelter with cholera. She was treated and after a couple of weeks, she could even start to go to the little school that we have built in this temporary shelter. And I got to meet Hinda when she already had been holding a pen for a couple of days and for the first time she could see her name in writing on a paper. <gasps> this is what it looks like. This is me. We need to reach every child. Even in the hardest of the situations, we can make a difference. Even in the toughest periods that we are facing now, we can make a change. And I would like to tell you a little bit about what I believe are the three key factors to be used when we are going to go out and make a big difference for children's rights. The first is, before you take a decision, as a prime minister, as a COO, as a student, you need to have the data. You need to know what you're going to do, otherwise you're going to invest your resources in the wrong decision. So the first thing we need to do if we're going to take a good decision on children's rights is to involve children. 
to listen to children, to know what actually is the problem and how can we solve it. This is also one of the fundamental rights of a child to make your voice heard, to be involved in a decision. There has been many good activities going on around the world. Perhaps you have participated in a hackathon. I organized one a couple, a couple of years ago. One example that I am very proud of is that two years ago now, when, when UNICEF was going to do its new strategic report about what is going to be our focus for the children between now and 2025, we had, of course, an idea and a list of things that we need to prioritize, but we decided to go out and consult young people around the world. We had a conversation sh through a tool called You Reporters, and we had a conversation with 214,000 children. And what we heard was that mental health has to be much higher up on the list who we're going to deal with children's rights. And climate change had to be much higher than we had put it. Another good example and why we should listen to children and involve children as a first step is that when I listen to you, when I let you speak, you will grow. And that in itself is an enormous value. Sweden was scrutinized by the United Nations Committee for the Rights of the Child, the UN Committee of the Rights of the Child, a couple of months ago. The government sends in a report. Civil society sends in a shadow report. But we decided to have the prime report made by children. We had 122 children who wrote the report. We had 12 children who participated in Geneva, in the room with the committee. And to see these children a child from the, a suburb in Gothenburg, for the first time to take an airplane, to sit in this room, to press the microphone and to tell the committee about her experience having parents in prison and how society has taken care of her or not, to see how she grown and maybe for the first time in her life felt, someone is listening to me, something is going to change. So involvement. The second is, integrate. I've been working in the Prime Minister's office, I've been working in the European Commission for several commissioners, I've been working for the Minister of Children's Rights in Sweden. And it doesn't matter how good you are as a Minister of Children, every minister in a government has to take responsibility for children's rights. Prime Minister, Minister of Finance, or an architect designing a city, or a business leader deciding on the leaves for their staff in a company. Every decision, every adult, every member of a government will affect the lives of children. Children's rights has to be integrated and we know how to do it. We do it for gender, gender mainstreaming, we heard about. It's time to mainstream children's rights to integrate and to make the risk assessment when you are closing down schools or you are not prioritizing routine vaccinations for children. So involve and integrate. And finally, when something is important, we invest. And you know, we know that investments in children's health, education, social protection is a positive investment for a country. We know that countries that invest in their children are doing better, also on social cohesion, on social sustainable development. And yet, almost every sector of children in the world is underfunded. We need long-term, reliable, flexible funding for children. But we also have to think new. We need to innovate and you need to help. We need to make impact investments grow. We know that more and more business leaders, more and more investors would like both to have a profit and have a purpose. We see that investment uh, with impact is growing. In addition, we need to be able to put on not only environmental glasses or gender glasses, we need to use child lens investment glasses. 
And this is an area where we have to develop a framework, we have to listen to experts like you, and to make this system work for children. So next time you, as future leaders, will take a decision before you do it, involve children, make sure you know what the problem is and how to solve it. Make sure it is not a project in your company or one minister in your government. It has to be integrated in your organization. And then, if it's important, you will invest in it. To summarize, we are faced with one of the biggest child crises that we have ever seen. Millions of children who could be anything, who could develop, who could be actors of change, are missing their opportunities, are even not surviving. And it does not have to be like this. We have the knowledge, we have the data, we have the power, we have the resources to do it. And we have individual leaders, business leaders, politicians, human rights fighters, young people around the world standing up, being brave, fighting for their rights. And we have young people like yourself. I remember what a professor told me once when I was studying in France a long time ago. He looked out at us and he said, remember that you are the lucky ones. You are the ones that have an opportunity you do not have to worry about finding clean water, finding food, going down in the suburbs, in, in the subways, in, in Sharkiv, hiding for the bombs. But with that opportunity comes a responsibility. Use your time, use your knowledge wisely. We often say that children are the most important thing. I do. You do, your parents do, most leaders do. It is time to show this in action. And for me, I want to dedicate my time and my passion to make sure that every child can develop into its full potential. And I hope that you would like to share this common mission together with me. Thank you.